All right, so on Thursday, we've got hydraulic jump day, and you have an assignment due. Uh, there won't be anything that you need to submit along with lab demo, too. We'll actually be doing it that day uh, rather than incorporating it into the homework. Any questions about the announcements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about that later. All right, so today we're going to discuss the... Uh, additional items of hydraulic jumps that we'll observe in the lab on Thursday. We've already talked about how you can calculate what the new depth is downstream or upstream of a hydraulic jump. So we've already taken a look at the Bellinger momentum equation, which is used for sequent depths. Today we're going to focus primarily on the location of jumps and their length. So just to review, when we were talking about energy loss last time, this is the formula that we can use to find out the length of energy that's lost. And so the units of delta E are meters or feet, depending on what unit system you're in. Um, and what it's talking about is you can calculate the total energy that exists in the flow at one by adding the depth and the velocity head together. And so that's the total energy at one. And this delta E is going to be how much is lost in the transition from one to two. And you can see from this diagram that there is a, uh, a pretty big change in the amount of energy loss as a function of the Froude number. And so the greater the Froude number, the greater the fraction of energy loss. This is on this axis a percentage basis. And so it's the percentage of energy that's lost. Um, and when you get the Froude number over 10, you're really losing all the, you know, the vast majority of the energy that was initially present. This curve is just expressing it in terms of the change in energy relative to the initial upstream depth. And this is not accounting for the velocity head. This curve does account for the velocity head because E1 includes the depth and the velocity head at 1. So we'll get a chance to observe a lot of different types of hydraulic jumps um, in the lab on um, on Thursday by varying mainly the depth of the underflow gate. We'll talk about what's causing the hydraulic jump when we get to a diagram that shows some of the different types that we'll observe. Before we get to that today though, I want to talk about jump location. And the ideal case is depicted on the uh, diagram here where we have water that's pooling deeper than its normal depth because of an underflow gate. And so water would have been going at this height under normal conditions, but because of the, uh, the, the opening that's small under the gate, the water level pools some amount, and uh, that gives it additional velocity that it can get through the gate in steady flow conditions. Remember, steady flow means that the uh, conditions aren't changing with respect to time, that the flow rate into some control volume is equal to the flow rate out of a control volume. So on Thursday, initially, when I put the gate into place, we won't have steady conditions. And um, so I've raised the screen here so I can draw a control volume and we can talk about steady flow. Okay, so I've put the dashed line. That means we're just going to keep track of what comes in and what goes out of this box. Here's the flow into the box. Here's the flow out of the box. So when I begin to lower that gate and impinge on the flow, initially the water level is going to be rising on the left side, you know, upstream of the gate. And the water level is rising, why? Mm -hmm. That's right. It's accumulating energy as it rises. And uh, where does that extra energy go once it gets enough, you know, when it rises to a certain elevation, eventually it'll stop. It won't go any higher. And so if you can think of it, energy is like a currency. What is the flow upstream of the gate spending that extra energy on? You know, the, the gate itself didn't uh, change position. And so, you know, once we close it and the water level is rising, Nothing changed about the gate height, so where is all that extra energy going that was accumulated as the water level rises? Velocity. Because when we first drop that down, 
the water level, uh, the depth may be the same coming out from under the gate, but the velocity will be small. And as the water elevation gets higher and higher, then that velocity increases. You remember the orifice equation from fluid mechanics that the velocity is the square root of 2gh, where the h is the distance from the centroid of the opening up to the water surface. We could use the, velo the orifice equation to approximate what the velocity is coming out from that gate. It's not perfect, though, because remember, we have uh, not just an opening with a free jet of water coming out, but the water is actually exiting onto a channel. And so there will be some additional resistance by virtue of that channel than there wouldn't be if it was just a free jet. But it's the same kind of idea, though, that the velocity goes up when the head of the water upstream of this opening increases. And so you know, that's, that's why it's important for us to think about steady flow and what's happening as the water level is rising and why. I guess it's, it's sort of like a catch-22. The water level is rising because of that small opening, because we, we constricted the flow. But it's not rising just because of that. It's rising ver for a very specific reason. It's rising until there's enough energy that it can get through that barrier and reestablish um, equilibrium. It, so it can reestablish, reestablish the flow in and the flow out being equal. So we'll have a, an underflow gate on Thursday. It'll be this same thing that's causing the hydraulic jump. Remember, the hydraulic jump forms because there's no business for there to be supercritical flow when you have a mild slope. Remember, we talked about the, uh, the two different slope. I guess there's three. You can have, no, there's more than that. There's a mild slope where it's very gradual, and a mild slope yields a normal depth that's subcritical. A steep slope is steep, and it yields a normal depth that's supercritical. There's also a critical slope, which is that one very rare slope that will give you exactly a normal depth equal to the critical depth. There's also an adverse slope, which basically means uphill. And maybe you've been to a water park before where they have you know, a very short uphill section where you're actually going the water's going uphill. So that's an adverse slope. They're not real common for an extended length, but they exist, I suppose. Uh, and then there's no slope, which is just flat, and that's a, a lake, I suppose. But what we're looking at here is right in this section is supercritical flow. And by the way, I'm going to mention right now, there will be a conceptual question where you need to provide a short answer on the final exam. Maybe more than one. But uh, it'll be more than just plugging numbers into equations. And so being able to understand and explain what's going on will be increasingly important for the final. So we have supercritical flow here because there's a lot of velocity. Because we have a high depth of water upstream of the orifice. So lots of velocity supercritical flow, but there shouldn't be supercritical flow here, not in the long run, because in the long run, since we've got a mild slope, we should expect to see subcritical flow. So it has to go through a transition. The supercritical flow has to jump up to uh, subcritical flow. It can't go through an easy, gradual transition. It has to go through rapidly varying flow transition, which is the hydraulic jump. Okay, so what makes this the ideal case, and uh, I don't use the word ideal meaning that we prefer it. That's not what I mean. I mean ideal just in the sense that it's the simplest case with the least number of complications. Um, ideal means we've got a curve here over on the left side where the rating curve for the tail water and the rating curve for the jump are the same. Let's look at the units of that curve and try and understand what it's saying. It's a, uh, a curve of flow rate versus depth. And what that curve says is that the channel downstream for a certain water depth is going to carry a certain flow rate. And so the deeper the water is, 
in the channel downstream, obviously, the bigger the flow rate will be. And so that's why this curve has a, uh, a nonlinear shape, is the deeper you get, the, uh, the flow rate increases very quickly to begin with, but then it begins to sort of taper off a little bit and reach a plateau. So Y2 and Y2 prime two are different things. And that's why here in red, I've warned you that we're going to start dealing with some new variable definitions. The new variable definitions are Y1 means the depth before the jump, and Y prime one means the sequent depth of Y1. So the prime means after a hydraulic jump, or sequent depth. That's what the prime means. Now, Y2 means the depth of the water in the channel downstream. So what makes this ideal is that the hydraulic jump has the same flow rating capacity curve as the tailwater. And that's why these two curves are on top of each other. The dashed line, you can kind of see that there's a dashed line on top of the solid line here. The two curves are coincidental. They're right on top of each other, meaning that for whatever depth you've got, you've got the same flow rate. And the importance of these curves will make more sense when we look at the non-ideal case. You'll get a better sense for what they are and what it represents and on the very next slide. What I want to point out is that the water, as soon as it contracts, you'll notice that actually the height of the gate isn't the same as the height of the water downstream of the gate. It actually continues to contract a little bit before it finally begins increasing and then jumps. And this is something that we'll observe in the lab on Thursday that you know, the, gu the uh, gate height will be some height, uh, you know, let's say maybe 10 millimeters, and it'll contract usually down to maybe between 60% or 70% of the gate height before it starts increasing again. In the ideal case, as soon as it has finished that contraction, it immediately jumps. And, uh, and so there's not a real excess length of it gradually getting deeper and deeper, like we'll see on the next slide, but just as soon as the water comes out of the gate and finishes contracting, that's when the jump begins. So that's the jump location. And then it jumps right back up to the normal depth for the channel. Okay, so let's contrast that to, and I wanted to highlight that Y prime one, meaning the sequent depth of the supercritical depth is equal to the normal depth downstream. That's not the case when we have the tailwater depth is less than the conjugate depth of the hydraulic jump. So now, this little dashed line showed what we were looking at before on the previous slide. In the ideal case, what we had was the water contracted a little bit and then it immediately jumped up to the normal depth flowing through the channel. But in this case, what we've got is a difference in capacity in the tailwater curve and the jump. And if you look at this figure on the left, look what it's saying. It's saying for a certain depth, the tailwater has more capacity, more flow rate than the jump. So what that means is that the channel that's downstream of the jump can carry a lot of flow. Either it's very wide or it has a pretty steep slope, but for whatever reason, all of the factors that go into the capacity of a channel, for a certain flow rate, it doesn't need as much depth as the hydraulic jump does. And so for that reason, it doesn't have the Y2 to meet the hydraulic jump downstream. You know, a hydraulic jump is kind of like a two-way street. Let me go back to the ideal case. You've got to have supercritical flow. That's one of the ingredients for the hydraulic jump. But the, the other thing is, is this uh, momentum depth diagram, we created momentum depth diagrams previously, and they look similar to the specific energy diagram. But remember when we had the momentum depth diagram, here we had the momentum function, here we had depth. So when we've got supercritical flow, let's say here's our Y1. When we've got supercritical flow, let's make it here. Okay, so here's our Y1. 
it wants to go through a hydraulic jump. But it's looking for a very specific depth to jump up to. It can only jump to its sequent. And so it was kind of a beautiful coincidence that right here, as soon as it finished contracting, it's looking, uh, it's looking downstream for its match, for its sequent. And it found it. Coincidentally, the, uh, the normal depth of this channel just happened to match the sequent depth upstream. That's not the case in this next slide. In this next slide, it's looking for that match here. The supercritical flow is saying, I need to jump up to my sequent depth, y prime 1. And, uh, and so it's looking, and it doesn't have that depth to jump up to because the channel has a pretty high capacity. And so for whatever Q that's going through the channel, it's actually a lower normal depth than matches right here. And so it gradually gets deeper and deeper. And what's happening is it's actually looking for the sequent depth that uh, is going to match the normal depth here. So in other words, we've got our momentum depth diagram. And what's governing is the, uh, the, hydro the sequent depth downstream. So we've got this depth that it's going to be constantly searching for. It's getting what's actually happening is this might have been this might have been where we could have jumped here but it's got to get deeper and deeper because this is the downstream depth actually in the channel and so the supercritical depth has to get deeper and deeper until finally now it's got the same momentum function and it can go through the hydraulic jump. So if we look at the tailwater rating curve, just again to emphasize, it's saying the tailwater carries more flow. It's further to the right. Here Q is on the x-axis. It's further to the right than the jump rating curve. So are there any questions so far? Maybe Siri can answer them. Yeah. The flow rate's the same, but what it means is that this channel um, for that flow rate is going to have a lower depth than in the ideal case. Ideal, what we mean by ideal is that the jump forms immediately after the gate, that there is no length where we have to go through this gradual increase in depth. Yeah. Yeah. So here you'll notice this y prime 2. We didn't have a y prime 2 on the previous slide. We had only a y1 and then it jumped up to its sequent depth y prime 1. So on this next slide, what they're saying is we've got a y1 and a y2. The y2 is the normal depth, but the sequent of the normal depth is y prime 2 and it has to gradually increase before it can match that sequent depth that's governing which is the tailwater normal depth downstream. Confusing, right? Super confusing. You should read the book before Thursday just to help it, you know, it's like fertilizer when you're planting a garden and you want the seed to grow, the seed is your knowledge. I'm saying that our book is crap basically, right? <laughs> if, if the book is fertilizer. That's, uh, the analogy always goes off the rails if you take it too far. The book's awesome. The book is not fertilizer, but not in that way. All right. So we'll see this, and the nice thing about it in the lab is I can control where the jump is. Just with my brain. No. It's actually, there's a, a little wheel on the upstream end of the, of the flume, and I can raise and lower the flume. And when I raise the flume, what I'm doing is I'm making the channel more steep. And so when I make the channel steep, the normal depth gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that causes the jump to run, as they call it. When the jump has to get further away from the gate, then the jump is running. And so you know, with this wheel that raises and lowers the flume, I can move the jump 
closer to the gate and further away from the gate. And so maybe one way to help you understand what's going on is just to think uh, about making the slope steeper. And you know, what's the chain of events that occurs when you make the slope of the channel steeper? What that affects is the normal depth. Remember Manning's equation, Q equals A to the 5 thirds power divided by the N, the friction factor, the wetted perimeter to the 2 thirds power, and the slope to the 1 half power. Where uh, for a rectangular channel, where we've got some depth, some normal depth, and the channel bottom width, then area would be B times Y sub N, Perimeter is 2y sub n plus b. And so when I increase the slope of the channel, I'm going for the same flow rate. If q is fixed, if you increase the slope of the channel, if s goes up, then the depth has to go down to maintain the same q. And so when I grab onto that wheel back in the lab and I start making it steeper and steeper, the governing thing that I'm changing is the downstream normal depth, y2. And so when I make y2 smaller, that just means that this is going to have to run longer and longer because if we go here to the uh, momentum depth diagram, what effect does it have if I'm making the downstream depth of the jump smaller? This is important. Don't just tune out on this. It's easy to tune out on a momentum depth diagram, but do so at your peril. We've got momentum and depth. Okay, so I made the channel steeper. What, I mean, what that means is that here is our, our dividing line. This is the critical depth, and up here is the subcritical region. Everything above the critical depth is the subcritical region, and down here is the supercritical region. Everything below the critical depth is in the supercritical region. So when I make the uh, channel steeper, that's forcing the subcritical depth downstream to decrease. And so like maybe initially I was here, pretty deep depth. But because I made the, ch the channel steeper, now I've got less of a subcritical depth. And so the match for that is going to be deeper than it was originally. So like here was when I had it not very steep, and here's when I had it steeper. And so they start getting closer together, the depth of the upstream of the jump and downstream of the jump. Let's go back to the previous slide. Here we have it's really shallow and it's pretty deep. There's a big difference between those it's because I was on this side of the momentum depth diagram. But now when I make the downstream depth shallower, so is upstream of the jump as well. So I've said as much as I can possibly say about this particular case, unless there are questions, then I can say more. That's right. Yeah, we wouldn't see a jump if it was critical slope. Okay, so this was ideal. The first one was ideal. Now what we're looking at is uh, where we've got a lot of capacity in the tail water. So the jump is running away from the gate. What do you think is going to be the opposite of that? The jump will go towards the gate. And it'll actually jump up, it'll actually submerge the gate. And that's what we've got here. We've got the tail water depth is greater than the conjugate depth of the hydraulic jump. So the dashed line shows where the jump kind of wants to be if there was uh, the ideal case. The ideal case means that the normal depth of the tail water just happens to match the sequent depth of this contracted depth after the gate. So you know, the gates open a certain amount, the water gets a little bit deeper, and then it's ready to look for a jump. Because it's supercritical flow on a mild subcritical slope. So it can't stay that way. So it's saying, I want to look for a jump, and this is the depth I want to jump up to. But the thing is, is that 
This channel, it can't carry very much flow. The channel has a, uh, a lower capacity curve than the hydraulic jump itself. So here's the tail water, and since it's further to the left, where on the x-axis is flow rate, since it's further to the left, that means for a certain depth, the tail water of the channel can't carry as much as the hydraulic jump. So because the water level was rising over here upstream of the gate, water is getting underneath this gate and through the orifice very easily. There's, you know, there's a, a lot of flow going through there. But the channel is kind of stagnant. It looks like, you know, around here after it rains, some of the streams just kind of look like ponds. That's what's happening in this channel. The, the channel downstream of the jump has very low capacity compared to the flow rate that's going through it. And so uh, it's kind of um, congested. The flow is congested if we borrow from a traffic analogy. Of course, our last analogy didn't go so well, so maybe I'll quit the analogies. But the, the water, you don't see the hydraulic jump here. Actually, uh, the hydraulic jump is submerged, and so it's really nothing to look at in the case of a drowned jump, where the tailwater uh, capacity is lower than the jump capacity. So those are the three cases that you need to understand the why of where the jump is and what the depths are. So what I encourage you to do is um, understand the variables, what they mean, not just memorize them and be able to write their definition, but you know, understand what is y1 versus y prime 1. Like what does the prime mean and uh, what does y2 mean? Just kind of convince yourself that it makes sense for them to all of a sudden be introducing new variables. We've never seen this y1 and y prime 1 before. Why did they suddenly start introducing a whole new set of variables? That's what I'd suggest you uh, review after class. So these are the different types of jumps. And uh, my hope is that we'll get to see most of these jumps on Thursdays. Actually, unfortunately, the uh, the flume isn't tall enough for us to get like the really crazy, vigorous, high froud number jumps, but we'll get to see a lot of them. So an undular jump is pretty unstable because it's so close to uh, su supercritical depth initially. So this is when the froud number is exactly equal to one. That means you've got critical flow. So there's really no jump if it's exactly one, but if you're even slightly greater than one for the froud number, then that means you have supercritical conditions, and if you've got a subcritical slope or a mild slope, then there will be a jump. So the Froude number between 1 and 1.7. Now, it's kind of instructive to look at these arrows that are indicating, they're sort of like velocity vectors. They're showing the direction of the flow, the magnitude of the velocity. And um, so it just looks like waves, essentially, for an undular jump. The weak jump is, uh, you'll finally start to see persistent rollers, not very big rollers, but uh, it's measurable. If we wanted to, we could take the pin gauge and measure the location of where the rollers are starting and where they're ending and compare that to some empirical equations we've got to predict roller length. Um, the ratio of Y2 to Y1 is kind of uh, one indicator of how strong the jump is, is the ratio of the upstream depth to the downstream depth after the jump finishes. Now, in these diagrams, it's, it makes it look pretty cut and dry where the jump starts and where the jump finishes. And the jump start, when we're back in the lab, that's easy enough to see when the jump starts. But the, kind of the hard thing to know is when does the jump end? Because back in the lab, we're going to have um, a couple of things working against us. And one is there's a, a little bit of waves. And so you, you kind of don't know when the jump is finished, am I just looking at splashing and waves, uh, or is it still the hydraulic jump and the, the depth is getting greater? So there's a little bit of an art to trying to identify where the jump ends. And the other thing that's going to be hard for us is that uh, at the end of the flume, back in the lab, we're going to have some uh, blocks in the way. 
we're going to have a choke, essentially. And so um, we won't know if the water is getting deeper because it's still going through the jump or if it's getting deeper because of the downstream choke. So let me just continue. If we have our channel and then in the lab what we've got is a couple of plastic plates that are going to be here and then the water is going over the edge of uh, that choke. And so, you know, the water is going to be pooling because of this, uh, you know, blockage that there is. And so, um, it won't be as obvious in the lab as it is here because in, in these diagrams it's assuming that you've got, you know, infinitely in both directions you've got a sort of infinitely long steady uniform flow after the jump and we won't actually see that. Okay, the oscillating jump in, uh, in the real world an oscill oscillating jump can be pretty dangerous. And hydraulic jumps, remember, one of the key places that they are found is after water flows over the spillway of a dam. And uh, what's downstream of a dam spillway is usually a river. And so what makes a hydraulic jump potentially dangerous, here's our water. And so if the water's coming down the spillway, and now it's super critical, it's got a lot of energy, and so it's going to go through the hydraulic jump, and then here's the river. So look at the velocity vectors on this diagram. It's showing that some of the velocity vectors are going downward into the channel bed. And that can cause a lot of scour and erosion if, uh, if the channel isn't lined with a pretty rugged liner like concrete. And so sometimes downstream of a, uh, of a, a spillway like this, they'll put big concrete blocks in the channel to try and dissipate energy and absorb some of the scour velocity that otherwise would start ripping up the sediment and carrying cobblestones downstream. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, a hydraulic designer is going to try and avoid an oscillating jump to try and make the channel configuration so that you don't have a froud number at one of between 2.5 and 4.5. So you try and prevent it, but then you also put measures into the stream to absorb the energy in case an oscillating jump forms. What we like, though, is a stable jump. Because if you look at the velocity vectors on a stable jump, none of them are going down into the channel bed. And so it's not going to be lifting up rocks or trying to move the sediments downstream and scour the bed. Um, you're dissipating energy kind of up into the surface, and that causes a really visible roller. And the dissipation of energy is, uh, is happening without any cost to the channel. So um, this, I think, is as far as we'll be able to see back in the lab, because to get a stable jump, a froud number as high as 9, you're looking at um, quite a lot of velocity at 1 to get a froud number of 9. We'll work an example later today where our froud number is in the ballpark, if I remember correctly, of around like 5 or so. And, uh, and in that example, the velocity is really moving. So to get a froud number of 9, almost double that, you've got really high velocities. And you know, back in the lab, what's causing our supercritical flow is the gate. And so there has to be you know, water depth upstream of the gate, we just have a limit to how tall the water can get. Once it gets too high, then it starts spilling outside of the flume. So we can't let that happen, which is why we probably won't be able to see a strong jump, sometimes called a rough jump. And again, in a rough jump, you may have some of the velocity vectors coming down into the channel bed, but you see an enormous change in depth between uh, upstream and downstream of the hydraulic jump and uh, large stilling basins are required to uh, kind of reestablish uh, quiescent flow before the stream gets into a uh, natural channel. Those are the different types of jumps that we'll observe. Now, uh, the last thing we're going to take a look at today are some empirical equations and some empirical approaches to trying to classify the length of a hydraulic jump. And the first one of these methods is uh, provided by the Bureau of Reclamation. 
We don't hear much about the Bureau of Rec Reclamation in this part of the country. Um, it's more of a, it's a federal agency that operates mostly out in the western United States. And uh, their job was to build and maintain dams through, you know, most of the 1900s. Uh, they haven't built a lot of dams lately. Um, but out west there were a lot of agricultural projects and uh, energy production projects where the Bureau of Rec Reclamation made dams and so at, because they were building a lot of hydraulic structures they were really interested in trying to um, understand how long hydraulic jumps would be and in this diagram you're noticing it depicts uh, two different things the length of the rollers and the length of the jump so part of the reason why the Bureau would maybe be interested in trying to identify what's the length of the jump is they'd want to know where they should place those energy dissipating concrete blocks. You know, how far downstream of the spillway should they be placed? And so, how long is the jump going to be? What this figure shows is, you first calculate the froud number upstream of the jump. Here where it says F sub N1, that means the froud number at location one, which in our notation system means upstream of the jump. So you find the, uh, the Froud number upstream, and uh, they've done us the favor of uh, putting the same classifications that we had here, the same Froud number ranges, those are on here. What we're looking for usually is a stable jump. And so on the vertical axis, it has the ratio of the jump length to the downstream depth length. And so you're starting off with the Froud number upstream of the jump, and you also have to know the downstream depth to finally calculate the jump length. Um, now usually the length of the rollers is about 40% of the jump length, uh, just roughly speaking. The text has two other empirical approaches to calculating the length of the jump. One is called the Hager equation. And I don't know about your calculators, but mine, to get the hyperbolic tangent, I have to go into the menus. So do you have hyperbolic tangent there on the Casio? There's arc tan there's tangent that we all know and love. There's arc tangent, hyperbolic tangent. So for me to get hyperbolic tangent, I had to go into the menu. How about on there? Anybody find it? Hyperbolic tangent? You've got it. Is it a special menu item, or is it just, uh, how do you get it? It's a button. On there. It's a button? Yep. Impressive. OK. So that's the hyperbolic tangent. Um, so in the Hager equation, you first off find the Froud number at 1. But instead of knowing the downstream depth, y2, like the diagram did, this nomograph, in the Hager equation, it's basing the length of the jump on the upstream depth, y1. Okay. It's just a jump that's real destructive. No, I, the destructive jump is uh, the turbulence that is uh, being dissipated. It's, uh, let me show you a destructive jump rather than saying what it was. I think... Uh, Let's see. It's the, uh, we had to connect to my computer to play that one. Let me do that. Okay, so this jump would be destructive except for the fact that it is uh, in a armored concrete channel where they put in a lot of reinforcement and the contractor has really been careful to make sure that there's a smooth finish on that concrete. But you can just imagine if it was like a muddy creek or uh, even if it was like a, a cobblestone, you know, like 
pretty big boulders could get moved around by uh, water that's experiencing that much turbulence. It would be destructive. All right, here is what the book calls another jump equation. Pretty descriptive name there, another jump equation. And uh, not a lot of horsepower in that one, the, the another jump equation. They, they mentioned that the uh, variable A varies between 5 and 6.9, but there isn't any information that I've been able to find that suggests uh, you know, which value to use in that range, other than I think you're supposed to calibrate the uh, another jump equation to observations in the field and then that would allow you to predict in the future what it's likely to do. And so it's just a ratio of the downstream depth, uh, the difference between the downstream depth and the upstream depth. So we're going to uh, try both of these out, all three of them, to find out how they perform in predicting the length of the jump. And uh, we've got that here in this example. So uh, we have a rectangular channel where it's 25 centimeters wide and the water flows at a velocity of 5 meters per second where the depth is 10 centimeters. So that, that's the upstream depth of the hydraulic jump. And uh, we don't yet know what the downstream depth is. You're going to have to calculate the downstream depth. And uh, in addition to calculating the downstream depth, I'd like you to use these three approaches. This isn't in your notes. I just made up this example today. So you're going to have to write some stuff on your paper there. So here is the flow. It goes through the jump. And here's what we want to know. Y1 is 10 centimeters. And the channel width is 25 centimeters. The velocity is 5 meters per second. What we want to know is what's the downstream depth after it goes through the jump, and then what is the length of the jump, L sub J, according to the three different methods. Method number one, this nomograph. Method number two, the uh, Hager, Hager equation, is it? Yeah, Hager equation. And then method number three, the another equation, where uh, let's have A equal to 5.5, just because that's somewhere in the middle. All right? So I will turn you loose on that. Go ahead and feel free to collaborate on this one. first thing we need to do is calculate the Froude number, which is easy for us because it's a, a rectangular channel. So we've calculated the flow rate based on the cross-sectional area and the velocity that's given. We know the flow rate's 0.125 cubic meters per second. Square that, multiply it by the uh, channel width, which is the same as the top width, 0.25 meters divided by G times area to the third. So our Froud number at 1 is 5.05. That tells us that we're in the stable jump range, which is good as far as hydraulic design is concerned because it's not going to introduce a, a lot of velocity down on the channel bottom. We use the Bellinger momentum equation here to find the downstream depth after the jump. So uh, we find that the downstream depth is 0.666 meters. And according to the figure, now it's subject to a little bit of interpretation since it's a graphical approach, but we just go up from where the Froud number is equal to about 5. So it's going to be between the 4 and the 6 here. So we go up, find the curve. It's maybe around 6.1. If we go over here to the left where the intercept is, it's about 6.1. And so 6.1 is equal to L sub J divided by Y2. And that's what I've done here is L sub J divided by Y2, which is the 0.666. So I move it over to the right-hand side of the equation and multiply it by the 6.1 from the curve. And that's where our jump length of 4 meters is from. So 4 meters long is going to be about 40% of that, roughly speaking, is the rollers. And then the rest of it is gradually increasing after the jump until it reaches the normal depth. 
So the uh, Hager equation, which uses the hyperbolic tangent, when we go through that, we get the uh, jump length is 4.96 meters. And so that's a pretty substantial difference, you know, 20% difference between the graphical approach and the Hager approach. And, you know, why is that? Most likely, the nomograph is for channels of a certain width range. We don't know. It, they don't give us the details. I think that if we probably went to the Bureau of Reclamation publication that this figure is originally taken from, they'd say over what channel width it's intended for. And probably the Hager equation is just uh, calibrated over, you know, it's an empirical equation. And so that empirical equation was derived from data over a different range. And we really see that is the case here over on the another equation. Always be suspicious of an equation nobody wants to put their name on, right? All the good equations, somebody's definitely wanting to put their stamp on that. So if it's just, uh, somebody, here's an equation, like they pass it under the table, you know? Uh, not going to be so good. 3.1 meters. Hey, maybe it works. You know, we can go back in the lab and uh, we should use these three equations when we're back in the lab on Thursday. And in fact, we're going to be doing more than listening to songs and eating cake. It actually will be a semi-educational uh, experience. And one of the things we're going to do is try these three equations and see which of the three matches best to what we observe and collectively agree is the beginning and the end of the jump. Yeah, I just, that's about the average. You know, they say A is between 5 and 6.9, and so I picked the middle range. Even if we'd picked the 6.9 range, it still would have been less than, it would have been a little bit closer to the other two, but it still would have been the lowest of the three. Was there a question over here? Why A, that? Because why not? Yeah, no good reason. Yeah, 3.8 is all it gets you? Yeah. Okay. Um, jump profile is another empirical approach that allows us to uh, estimate what the shape of the hydraulic jump looks like. Somebody who'd be interested in this is uh, somebody who is surfing on a hydraulic jump. Um, have I showed you guys the video of river surfing in Munich? I'd better do that right now um, so that this equation makes good sense to you. Give me just a second. Let's see. There's one that's set to music. It's real nice, but I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find the right one. Okay, give me just a second here. We've got plenty of time.
I don't know if this is the best one. I've never seen this one before. This is different than the one I usually play for uh, students when I'm telling about hydraulic jumps. So I've never seen this. Hopefully it's not all non-technical. driving. There they are. So this is a section where the water comes out from underneath the bridge. Super critical because the flow is contracted to get under that bridge. And it sets up a standing wave, which is the same thing as a hydraulic jump. So they can surf right there in the city. Munich is landlocked. It's not on the coast. I saw another one when I was ser searching. It showed people in costumes. We better, probably better watch that one. River City Music. They were in Oktoberfest costumes, so this I got to see. All right. A little more idyllic, right? So what the equation we're going to look at in a minute says what the, uh, the angle is that they can surf on the profile of the jump. Has anyone been river rafting on the New River before? There's a few places where there is a standing wave and uh, you can actually get the raft down in there and stay put for a little while. At least they did that when I was river rafting. Where's the costume people is what I want to know. They're in their later hosen, surfing the old-fashioned way. <laughs> I think that was a red herring. I don't see anyone in later hosen. When did they start doing this? I don't know. He almost hit the concrete there, right? Well, all right, so that is what this is about. These different approaches are trying to classify the jump height as a function of position. And so here on the x-axis, you can see x relative to the height of the jump. Here you can see the depth relative to the height of the jump. And so what they're calculating h sub j is the difference between the upstream depth and the downstream depth. So h sub j is y2 minus y1. And um, hold on. Yeah, I think so. I don't know what the, uh, now that I'm taking a second look at the, uh, the figure here, they're saying y. No. I think that the, uh, this is, yeah, this has got to be the water surface. I'm not sure what this Y depth is, though. Mm. So it is uh, a way of classifying the shape of it. And what you can see, they've got different Froude numbers here. And as the Froude number increases, so does the slope of the upstream face of that hydraulic jump. And so the jump on the video that we were just looking at, it varies seasonally. They're, it's only after they've had wet weather that there's enough flow that there's a nice solid jump for them to surf. And so, you know, it's sort of like in all the old Southern California movies when some kid would run into the school and say, surf's up, you know, like, I'm sure in, there's an equivalent German expression in Munich for when the river conditions are just right. So you can take the uh, surfboard on the subway to the center of town. So we won't actually do any calculations related to jump profile, but we'll take a look at this. We'll observe it on Thursday. We'll try and uh, 
look at how steep the jump is relative to the fraud number increasing. All right, so let's just look uh, finally at the announcements here one last time. Thursday is uh, your homework assignment is due. And save some room for cake because we'll have a cake on Thursday back in the lab. Hydraulic jump cake. It's the best kind of cake. So save some room. All right, see you Thursday.